I'm Andrew Patterson from interest.co.nz. Welcome to another in our business success series. With me today, the founder of Medikids, Dr. Kim Chilman Blair. Hi, Kim. Hi. So, Kim, just tell us a little bit about the way this business began because you actually qualified in medicine. Uh, and I wondered if there was a particular case that that emerged for you that actually gave you this idea to get this business started? Sure. So when I was working as a doctor at Starship Hospital, I met a child who had epilepsy. And it was, in fact, her mother was asking me, where can I get information for her about this? And so I did my own research and searched around and just couldn't find anything for the, for the child about epilepsy. And so <clears throat> I soon realized that it wasn't just a problem in New Zealand, but in fact, around the world, there was no information on epilepsy for the child. Everything was just uh, directed at the parents and caregivers, but nothing for the young patients. And when we're expecting them to take anticonvulsants for potentially the rest of their life and turn up to their clinic appointments and understand what is going on, it, it just seems crazy, uh, staggering to me, in fact, that we don't talk to young patients at their own level. So that was the first light bulb moment, if you like, that set off in my mind that we needed to do something about the problem. And then as I researched further, I realized, well, it wasn't just epilepsy, but that children with hemophilia and cancer and all these diseases, depending on if they were taking medicines or having surgery, there was just nothing across the board for any of them. So that was the impetus to set up Medikids. Was it difficult to give up your medical career because this was something you'd studied long and hard for uh, and you've obviously had to put that to one side in order to pursue the business? Was that a difficult decision? Yeah, it was a difficult decision because I'd worked so hard to get into medicine and then to get all the way through and so to finally get there and then have another calling um, was quite interesting but at the end of the day the opportunity was just too massive for me to ignore. Here I, I had stumbled across a, a market gap in the global market that wasn't being filled and that you know there was nothing else on the market there and to this day we still don't have any competitors so uh, I just had to grab the bull by the horns. <laughs> Intriguing though that nobody actually had thought of this idea before now that must have come as something of a surprise. Yeah so I I think that around you find within a hospital maybe there's a nurse or a doctor who feels very strongly about one particular part of medicine and they'll get together and they'll write something for the children and, and have it there in the hospital. But uh, when they move on, so does the information. And so we find that there's not a, a standardized source of information around the world where children know that they can go to to get information about what they're going through. And of course, you started your master's degree uh, at Otago. You were studying for entrepreneurship. Is that when the idea came about? No, it was the other way around. So I had had the idea for a while and I knew that I had to understand a little bit more about business because I knew there was a great opportunity, but I wasn't sure, I didn't even know what a shareholder or a director was at that time, because, you know, me medicine, you business. So yeah. <laughs> I had a lot to learn. And so then I found out about the entrepreneurship degree, which, by the way, I failed. I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> because um, I didn't have my assignments in on time or whatever. So I, it's an interesting point that, um, that I didn't pass the entrepreneurship degree, but anyway. Um, that's why I did it, and I'm still glad I did, because it uh, gave me the information that I needed to know on how to build a business. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so so you, I mean, you took the learnings anyway, yeah. and perhaps perhaps not necessarily passing the qualification. Yeah. Does, it doesn't make a lot of difference. No. Um, but w when you look at the success that you've achieved and the speed with which it's grown, I mean, this you now operate what is it in 28, uh, 48 countries, yeah. and 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 the books are translated into twenty eight languages. So this has been fairly explosive growth in, in the in the space of only three or four years. Has, has that surprised you? Uh, yeah, it has actually. It was beyond my wildest dreams, to be completely honest. Um, I didn't think that the demand would be this great for this information. Uh, and it's just fantastic that it's a, a, a small Kiwi initiative by a group of doctors here that is managing to affect the lives of two million kids around the world. Uh, it's it's 
quite humbling actually yeah and, and what about the challenges because obviously it's complex uh, multiple countries multiple languages how have you dealt with the the complexity of running this business model yeah so um that was i had tried out initially with a picture book and it had gone down like a lead balloon really and i had tried to write the initial stuff myself and so i think kids are they know when there's an adult that's trying to be cool and funny and so they could see straight through me and um, it just wasn't very engaging. And so then uh, a girl that I was working with in New Zealand, a Tracy Strudley at the time, she said, you know, I think this would be great for a graphic novel approach and that was it. It was, um, I, I then called up the then CEO of Marvel and said, I've got a great idea for a series of comic books explaining medicine to children. I think this could really work. And uh, it all was downhill from there. Uh, what about the video option? Because we know that many of these young people perhaps are not as reading as much, but uh, I'm thinking that video is something that you've got to be having to pursue perhaps in the future. That's something that's taking off at the moment, actually. So we're now moving into digitizing the comics. So they still look like comic books, but they move and um, have a, a slightly animated. We don't go all the way into full animation because then you're now competing with Pixar and all these massive things and kids have a, um, a very high expectation when it comes to animation. We think that we will get there in the end, but for now we have these very cool swipe through on your iPad animations of a digital comic. How do you stay connected with the, the kids themselves? Because obviously it's important that you're getting regular feedback on, on you know, your, your output and, and that they have some voice in the, in the production process. How, how do you manage that side of the business? Absolutely. So we have a, a, me, a medical youth advisory board uh, of kids aged between 6 and 15 and they come together once a quarter and let us know what they love, what they'd like to change, uh, how they feel about the on-offline thing. And um, then on each particular book, then we go to the Disease Foundation or the charity that we're working with, and we ask them if we could have input from patients. So we get the children's input all the way through. This is based in the UK, but now we're looking to replicate that in the US. Yeah. What about future growth? Uh, are you going to be able to maintain uh, the growth of this business on its, on its current trajectory? Uh, absolutely. I feel like MediKids is on the edge of being about to explode. That's what it feels like. Um, we've just moved to the US and the feedback there from everyone is so fantastic. It's just that uh, not only do children need the medicine explained to them, but there's a whole gap there where children need to be advocated for in the whole journey. So we want to expand the MediKids offering of what we're doing right now so that um, what they need when they first get diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, for example, is different to the information they want six months later, which is different to what they want to know in their teens when they're saying, well, can I drink alcohol with this? So there's a there's a whole kind of um, gamut of information that needs to be given to them, and so we want to be able to expand our current offering to meet all of their needs. Why the decision to uh, establish the business in London when, when this was a business perhaps that could have also been run uh, out in New Zealand? Yeah, so it, um, the decision to go over there was really really because we realised early on that it was a global offering and um, my co-founder Dr Kate Hersov, her partner was living over in London and he said to me, he sat me down one night and said, you really have to come over here, this is a, this is a global offering, you need to raise some serious money and come over here and do it, so I did. And how has the capital raising side of the business worked for you? Uh, it, it's gone extremely well. Um, it was, to be honest, it wasn't that difficult because what we have here is an amazing opportunity to do a business that does good for the world. So we had, we were very fortunate in that we could generate interest from a lot of wealthy people who wanted, yes, they saw that this was a valid business and they could make money, but also it's such a great thing to be doing. You know, you're helping sick kids, you're helping families come through this very difficult time in their lives and to be a part of that um, makes you feel good as well as having a return on your investment so um, it was it's been great for us yeah was it was there any business acumen in your, in your background there that um that that perhaps you were able to draw on or did has this really surprised you that um, 10 years on from perhaps when you started your medical studies you would end actually up in business well 
I did my first business was when I was about nine years old. I started selling mice, and I <laughs> and I tried to pass them off as rats to the biology teacher at school and all sorts. So um, it was my first one, and then I did another one selling shampoo and conditioner. Um, so I think I probably always had that in me, um, the want to to be in business and I just didn't know what it was going to be so this was the perfect thing between my interest in medicine and interest in paediatrics in particular and a business idea. When we think about your journey as, a, as an entrepreneur, what have been some of the key learnings that, that you have uh, mastered that perhaps you might pass on to somebody else wanting to follow in your footsteps? Um, I think the most important thing I have learned is just never to give up. I think that the the line between failure and success. People always say that it's so close between the two of them and I really think it is and there's been ups and downs along the way and it's never just easy but you just have to never ever give up. And I think that's the thing is that most people um, do give up at some point and the ones that don't are maybe a little bit crazy but I think that's a necessary part of success. Yeah. What's been the, the most challenging part of this process? Because it, it, it's complex with the, with all the different languages and so forth that you're operating in. And how have you dealt with, with some of those sorts of issues? Um, I think the most challenging thing is probably trying to wrap your, your head around all the different elements of the business that you don't necessarily know much about. Um, I'm a bit of a technophobe, for example, and we're going into this whole digital arena, but I think it's just about surrounding yourself with people who are better than you at, and at all these different aspects and then trusting them to get on with it and then just checking in and making sure that you're going in the right direction and then maintaining just the brand and the integrity of the brand and what we want to do and what we want to achieve in the world. Yeah. Also, the success you've achieved in, in medicine, which we know tends to be a fairly conservative institution in, yeah. in terms of the way it works, so you, you're pushing some real boundaries here, yeah. and you know, is that something that obviously must give you some, some pleasure that as a medical professional you, you're yeah. pushing into some new areas? I guess I'm a pushing the boundaries kind of person, <laughs> naturally, and so I, I think if you give me a boundary, I'll push it, and I, so I like that aspect of it, it, it is. And, um, yeah, we do occasionally come up against people who are very old and set in their ways and say, oh my goodness, you can't explain medicine to children like this um, and have all these colours and bright things. But at the end of the day, we say to them, well, we're not necessarily wanting to have you as our target audience. We really want to be able to be speaking to the kids. So the fact you don't like it is probably a good thing for us. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that struck me, because this is very good for promoting um, the profession of medicine to, to young yeah. people at an early age, um, yeah. to get them interested in, in that. And sure. that's been another side benefit, no doubt, of these books. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, some doctors have said that they've given them to their colleagues to read. <laughs> because, you know, they go through and explain anatomy and physiology, pathophysiology in such an easy to understand way and definitely medical students could probably learn about the diseases by reading them as well. Yeah. Yes, because I, I was reading, uh, so, uh, watching some videos from patients who said that, you know, that they've had three or four years dealing with some of these diseases, spoken to multiple consultants, yeah. and even after the reading the book, they were still able to find out a whole lot of things that didn't, they'd never been told before. Yeah, I think that the point of, of MediKids is that it goes in and explains the actual medicine. So rather than talking around the sociology of it or how this is going to affect me necessarily, we go in and it's almost the concept of taking the, the pad and the pen that you you would go in and see the doctor and they would draw a liver on and they would show you what happens and show you in the cells and so we try to take that uh, pad and pen concept and turn it into a, a cartoon but at the same time it's delving down into the actual biology of why is this happening and how do my medicines work which just is a level that doesn't get explained to the children so I think that's why kids respond so great to this because the doctors aren't going into that that depth and the thing is um, you know kids do know more than we give them credit for and they can take on this information and they want to know so um, it's really good to be able to give that to them. And the major goals for, for the next five years, what have, you, what have you set yourself to try and achieve? Okay, so five-year plan is to get the US um, up and running properly and then um, 
my goal from the very beginning has always been to set up the Medikids Foundation. So um, a part of the percentage of the profits of the business go to run the Medikids Foundation, which is set up to give uh, supplies and health to healthcare to children in the developing world. Um, so we have a bank account set aside and we put money into that uh, now. And then I, my dream is to be able to go off and see that happen and to work with kids and see that as the business becomes more profitable, so there does the foundation and we can help kids in a real way. And, and so the foundation is, is, is supporting the, the publication of the books in third world countries and so forth? Yes. Yeah, and and actual um, clinics as well. Finally, when you look at this business and what you've created, what aspect of it gives you the most pleasure? Um, I think it's probably that part about the foundation because that's where the whole idea started to try and find a business that could help kids in the third world without having to go and always be fundraising and ask people for money. So to find a business that was self-sustaining that could do that and to have the idea and then to now set up the business and now the business is profitable and, and this is all happening to achieve that end game is what gets me up in the morning.